What should you be putting in your vintage Mustang or muscle car cooling system? Antifreeze, coolant, water, additives? Beyond the old adage of following the manufacturer's recommendations, how do you know what coolant to use to keep your car cool and protected? What coolant you should you use if your car has a modern engine? Hi, my name is Walter. This is the GT350 Garage. And in this video, I'm gonna explain the difference between old and new coolant technology and what modern technologies are compatible with the majority of muscle cars from stock applications to pro touring builds and what coolant I'm running in my car and why. I'll talk about proper handling and storage of new coolants, the need to test your coolant annually, and when to flush and change old coolant. Um, as well as proper disposal of used coolant. I'll also touch on coolant for competition use and why they have to be different. So at this point, I'd like to say that if you're a subscriber, thanks for watching, and if you haven't subscribed yet, what are you waiting for? This video contains information that I've learned over my 30 plus year career in the automotive industry and includes some recent research that I've done to make sure that this knowledge is complete and up-to-date in order to bring you reliable, factual, and trustworthy information. So let's talk about coolant. Whether your car is completely stock or heavily modified, you should know that the coolant that came in our cars more than 50 years ago is probably not the best choice today. That green liquid in your radiator is important stuff, but did you know that the original coolant technology specified for your Mustang is nearly 100 years old? Let's talk about some basic information to help you better understand what you should be putting in your classic car's cooling system with so many options on a modern parts store shelves. I've been asked this a lot. Aren't antifreeze, coolant, and water the same thing? Antifreeze is a concentrated glycol-based fluid that was originally developed in the 1920s to keep your engine from freezing in the cold of winter, and that's where it gets its name. It's also designed to protect your cooling system from corrosion, and it offers a higher boiling point. In its undiluted form, antifreezes have a freezing point of around negative 5 Fahrenheit or negative 20 Celsius and a boiling point of around 325 Fahrenheit or 163 Celsius. But straight antifreeze can't actually increase your engine's temperature operating range because the problem it has is its ability to absorb the heat at the source, your engine, and then release it through the radiator. It, it simply doesn't transfer the heat well at all. Water, on the other hand, distilled water specifically, is great at conducting heat. It's very effective at absorbing the heat from your engine and then releasing it through your radiator. So if it transfers heat so much better than antifreeze, why not just use 100% water in your cooling system? While water offers good heat transfer properties, it lacks the ability to protect your cooling system against corrosion, and distilled water is lacking in minerals, and it'll actually try and strip them from your cooling system, from the radiator, from the block, from the heads, anywhere it can find minerals that it can remove, it will try and do that, which is what causes water to rust the cooling system of an iron block engine so quickly. So it also doesn't offer proper lubrication to things like water pump seals. Um, but most importantly, water has a rather high freeze point of 32 degrees Fahrenheit or zero Celsius and a boiling point that's lower 212 Fahrenheit or 100 Celsius. So these factors are why water alone shouldn't be considered a long-term alternative to coolant. 
Now, you also want to avoid tap water because it brings unknown minerals and potentially undesirable chemicals like chlorine into the cooling system. And chlorine and, and some of these other chemicals don't react well with some of the components in your cooling system, copper, brass, solder, aluminum. You don't know how they're gonna react and therefore you don't wanna put them into the cooling system. Now, it's from the properties of antifreeze and water that we end up with coolant. So coolant is what antifreeze becomes when it's mixed with water. The addition of water to antifreeze produces a mixture that has an even lower freezing temperature than either antifreeze or water on their own. So in its 50-50 mixed form, most antifreezes have a freezing point around negative 35 Fahrenheit or negative 37 Celsius, and a boiling point of around 228 Fahrenheit or 108 degrees Celsius. Changing the ratio of antifreeze to water can change its characteristics. The more antifreeze you add, the more freeze and corrosion protection you have, up to about a 70-30 ratio. Adding more water improves the heat transfer abilities while retaining the majority of the corrosion and the freeze protection up to about a 30-70 ratio. But for most applications, it's best to just stick to a 50-50 ratio. And that balances the three main factors of freezing, boiling, and corrosion resistance. Um, it also leads to the longest life of the product in your cooling system. So what's in the antifreeze coolant mixture in your cooling system? Prior to the 1990s, most coolant used inorganic additive technology, silicates, in a neutralized alkaline solution, meaning very, very mildly acidic. And up to that period, antifreeze was made most almost exclusively from an ethylene glycol base. It was cheap and its job was protecting the cooling systems of everything that wasn't air-cooled at the time. The problem with silicates is that in a, as an additive package, it deteriorates or depletes and loses its ability to protect the cooling system after about two years. The silicates actually drop out of the solution out of suspension, forming solids in the cooling system. And if you've ever found a green gooey substance in the bottom of a recovery bottle, those are your silicates. So without those in the actual suspension of the coolant, they're not protecting your cooling system. The problem with ethylene glycol itself is that it's pretty toxic stuff and because of its sweet taste, it was responsible for some serious harm to children and small animals over the years. It only takes about three tablespoons of ethylene glycol to shut down the organs of an average size adult and do irreversible damage. So the smaller you are, the less it takes and the faster it does its damage. It's pretty bad stuff, so you wanna make sure you handle it responsibly. Now, Due to the reputation that ethylene glycol in our cooling systems was getting, in the 1990s we saw a change to propylene glycol based coolants that don't present the immediate harm and potentially fatal health hazards, even though propylene glycol in other forms appears in, in food products because it it's actually safe for human consumption. In antifreeze, it's not, okay? Don't get that mixed up. So, um, ironically enough, ethylene glycol coolants are still being produced. So you should treat all coolants like they're toxic. With, with the change to um, propylene glycol-based coolants that started in the 1990s, came a notable new type of coolant, and they're called organic acid technology, or OAT coolants. The most notable is GM Dexcool, and it's known for its distinctive bright orange color. 
OAT coolants were followed pretty closely by a third type of coolant called hybrid organic acid technology. And there's actually several different variants of OAT and HOAT coolants using combinations of inorganic additives and organic acids like silicates, phosphates, nitrates, borates, and 2-EHA. More on that stuff in a minute. Now, there's some issues with some of the additives used in the OAT and HOAT coolants that need to be addressed to understand compatibility. Most IAT coolants rely on silicates in the form of a neutralized silicilic acid. OAT coolants rely on phosphates in the form of neutralized phosphoric acid, nitrates, which are neutralized nitric acid, or borates, which is neutralized boric acid. And these acids that have been neutralized actually protect the metal in the cooling system by maintaining a very mildly alkaline or acidic form. Then there's that nasty stuff called 2-EHA, which is short for 2-ethylhexanoic acid. 2-EHA has been widely blamed for seal and gasket failure in GM Dexcool applications. Uh, and it's a known plasticizer, making it incompatible with nylon, Teflon, plas um, different plastics, silicone, and some of the other seals and hoses that are available in the market. The more notably controversial additive, though, is nitrates for their incompatibility with some unprotected aluminum components. So if the aluminum components haven't been coated with a protective coating, nitrates will actually eat away at them and deteriorate them very quickly. Um, the other issue with nitrates is that as an additive, they deplete rather quickly like a silicate and have to be restored using uh, a thing called supplemental coolant additives or SCAs. There is an all water exception and that's competition use, but with additives. Glycol based coolants aren't always an acceptable choice. As a technician, I can tell you that working on a floor covered in coolant is like working on a greased slip and slide. Um, as a driver, from on-track experience, even a little coolant on the rear tires can feel like you're driving on racing slicks in heavy rain. This produces one circumstance where water's the preferred coolant choice, competition use. For competition use, water has several key factors that make it more suitable than any other option. To begin with, water evaporates quickly and cleanly, leaving the driving surface clean and safe for other vehicles to operate on. If you plan to compete in any competition events, running your car on track or on any designated competition course, check the rules and make sure that your coolant choice meets the requirements of the events that you participate in. Most events do allow the use of additives like Redline Water Wetter and Royal Purple's Purple Ice to improve the corrosion resistance and lubrication properties of the water um, safely for competition use. Now, some events will allow you to use glycol coolants, but do so at your own risk because glycols produce a very slippery surface when they're spilled and they can make the racing surface nearly impossible to safely drive on. If you're responsible for glycol coolant on the racing surface because of an overheating condition or an accident, the event organizer will usually charge you for the cleanup costs and um, those cleanup costs can be rather extensive and costly uh, requiring the use of dry sweep and a bunch of manual labor to get the job done. You'll also be subject to the uh, ire and um, disdain of your fellow participants for um, you know kind of interrupting their day of, of fun or competition. Servicing your cooling system. You may have done this a hundred times before, or this might be your first time, but it's always worth doing the job correctly, and that includes doing it safely and responsibly. So it's always important to know the hazards and the information about what you're doing before you start. Remember, antifreeze is a chemical, 
So use appropriate safety precautions like eye protection, uh, wear disposable gloves to pretend, prevent unwanted contact with the new or used antifreeze coolant. If you spill, clean it up immediately with paper towels or flush the area with lots of water to avoid accidental exposure to humans or animals. Keep your unused antifreeze in its original labeled container with the cap sealed tightly. If you diluted your antifreeze with water to make coolant, mark the container accordingly. Now, coolant should be tested annually. I recommend checking the coolant in the spring when you get your car out for the year and in the fall before it goes into winter storage. You can use a simple test strip to check the alkalinity of the coolant in most cases and know where you stand. And that's just a matter of removing the radiator cap and dipping the test strip into the coolant, okay? Um, very quick, simple process. Um, another method is to test your coolant with a coolant tester called a hydrometer. Now, this is a simple test done with a tool that compares the weight of the coolant to water, and it determines its acidity, okay? Or how alkaline it is. The specific gravities of water, ethylene glycol, and propylene glycol are 1.000, 1.080, and 1.040, respectively. If the specific gravity goes up above those numbers, the coolant has become too acidic and should be replaced. If you can't replace it immediately, you can mix a tablespoon of baking soda into a couple ounces of distilled water and with the engine running, add that to the coolant mixture and it will help lower the acidity back down to a level that the coolant won't allow corrosion to occur until you can service the system. Now, used coolant needs to be handled with care, stored in a closed container that's labeled and disposed of properly. Check with your local coolant sources, parts houses, big box stores, about recycling coolant. And if they can't help, Check with your local county offices to find out where you can properly dispose of old automotive fluids like used engine oil and used engine coolant. Never pour your coolant down a household drain, into the gutter, into the sewer, or directly on the ground anywhere. It can leach into the water system and it can continue to do harm long after you've improperly disposed of it. So it probably sounds like there's no good coolant choice to put back into your vehicle, but there's actually some great options. There's an entire segment of the coolant market devoted to ELC, or Extended Life Coolants. Now, some of these products are extremely versatile, despite being designed primarily for the medium heavy-duty trucking and heavy equipment industries. ELC can be made using ethylene glycol, propylene glycol, or propylene glycol methyl ether, or PGME. Um, ELC can be an OAT or an HOAT coolant. It comes in nitrited or nitrite-free forms, so you'll want to make sure that the bottle says nitrite-free. And yes, some ELC contains 2EHA, so if you want to use anything that I haven't listed in the description below, You'll need to read the safety data sheet, the SDS, on the manufacturer's website and check for it. Now, that brings me to what I'm installing in my 66 Shelby's cooling system. So I decided to go with an ELC coolant. This is Final Charge Global from Peak. It is a nitrite-free, phosphate-free, um, borate-free, silicate-free, 2EHA free extended life coolant. This particular coolant is designed to last up to a million miles in a class 8 semi or up to 20,000 hours or 8 years in off-road applications. Now 
under those circumstances, those are going to be heavy use vehicles and this coolant is going to be subjected to high heat cycles and lots of different uh, conditions and heavy usage. We're not going to run our muscle cars 20,000 hours. We're not going to drive them a million miles. So the only thing that really matters to us is how long is it good for? Now, some of the coolants that I have listed in the description below are 10-year coolants. This one happens to be listed as an 8-year coolant, but I have no doubt that for the use that I'm going to be putting it to, this is an, an easy 10-year coolant, um, just like some of the other options. Uh, this coolant costs about the same as an original green formulation coolant at your local parts store. So if you're looking at buying coolant, why not spend a dollar or two more and buy a coolant that's going to last potentially three to five times as long as the coolant that you've been using previously? If your car is due for that coolant change, flush the old coolant out and replace it with a better product. So with that, um, let's top this thing off. There's that red color. You will notice if you spill this coolant that it leaves a white residue. And uh, that's okay. It wipes up pretty easily. There we go. Now, when I start the car, I'm sure the coolant level will drop just a bit, and I'll have to top it off. I've made the cooling system capacity on this car almost three gallons with the larger radiator, um, and that's a good thing because the larger amount of coolant volume is going to help me keep the car cooler. So that brings me to a point where I'd like to sum up this video with these final thoughts. Your old green coolant definitely needs to be tested and probably needs to be replaced. It's time to move forward and protect your car with a more modern coolant technology like an ELC. You want to avoid all variants of Dexcool, nitrite equipped ELCs, and any of the new long life universal coolants that are being offered for all vehicles. ELC coolants are probably the best balance of coolant performance, uh, cooling system protection, and long life available to be used in your vintage Mustang or other muscle car. Whether it's a basic stock six cylinder application to the wildest pro touring build. And with that, I hope you enjoyed the video and find this information helpful and useful. And if you did, give a thumbs up and let me know. I appreciate any and all feedback. If you have any questions about the video, go ahead and ask away in the comments section. I try to respond to everyone within a day. And again, if you haven't already, subscribe to the channel and turn on notifications to get notified of new content when I post it. And with that, thank you for watching, and I hope to see you again with my next video.